The second pre-Socratic philosopher we will look at after Thales is Anaximander. Anaximander is one of my favorite pre-Socratic philosophers. He has many accomplishments to speak of. I will only mention a few here. Likely he's the one who introduced a sundial into the culture. That doesn't mean he necessarily invented it, but he brought it into the Greek culture. He made a map of the world, which for his time frame would have been a map of the Middle East, basically covering contemporary countries such as Italy and Greece and Turkey and Israel and Egypt and that area, probably not too far beyond that what we know as the Middle East. And he wrote a book called Concerning Nature. Now, we just have fragments of that, and even, even the fragments are kind of reports from other authors about what Anaximander had to say. But the book itself was the first work of its kind because it included writings on astronomy, biology, chemistry, mathematics, physics, and, of course, philosophy. Anaximander showed that pre-Socratic desire to understand the world around him, and so he investigated everything. He wanted to understand and be able to explain everything that he could. Anaximander is a material monist, and that means that he believed everything that exists is ultimately just one thing. That's what a, a monist is in terms of our context right now. And for Anaximander, the one thing is the apiron, or it might be translated the unbounded or indefinite. And so that's what the arche is for Anaximander. And of course, as we mentioned with Thales, the arche is a central concept for the pre-Socratics even into Plato and Aristotle. And one way of thinking about the Arche is to think of it as the originating principle of all that exists. You might uh, slightly modify that and think of it as the foundational principle of everything that is, the one principle that everything must follow. Another way of thinking about the Arche is that it is the one foundational thing that provides the existence of everything else. Now, again, you could think of this as an originating substance, uh, the kind of a cosmological view, that which out everything flowed from, came out from, or you might think of it as a constitutional analysis, that is, thinking of the RK as what gets at the foundational substance of what exists now. And so the RK has this rich, broad meaning, and Anaximander identified it as the Apiron. So that doesn't mean Anaximander rejected the four basic elements that the Greeks uh, generally thought existed. So we have earth, air, fire, and water. Those are the four basic elements, and Anaximander affirms that and says that all our familiar objects are made of these four elements. So uh, biological entities like rabbits or trees, as well as uh, inanimate objects like rocks or clouds, are all going to be made of these uh, four substances. And for Anaximander, one thing that's very important for him is this idea that each of the substances, each of these basic elements, is essentially related to one of two pairs of opposites. So we have, what are the pairs of opposites? The pairs are hot or cold, and then dry or moist. Now this makes the most sense when we talk about water and fire, uh, but even water, of course, could be hot. But in its natural state, that is, in the ocean, water is cold, generally speaking, and moist, obviously. On the other hand, fire is hot and dry. Now, he, he did also assign those attributes to earth and air, but uh, he focused on the concepts that clearly relate to water and fire. Uh, so 
what we can make of that is that each uh, substance that exists, each of the four elements, have these contradictory properties in their nature. The first fragment, and I should say the, the numbering may vary according to your text. So uh, in some versions you might identify this as fragment 12 and some as uh, fragment 13. But in any case, uh, one of the most important fragments includes uh, several quotes that are interesting. So for example, they pay penalty and ret retribution. What, what is it that he's talking about? He's talking about these opposites, the, the hot and the cold. So paying penalty and retribution, uh, hot and cold wax and wane. They, they have dominance and then they decrease in their presence. And Anaximander finishes this idea with this concept for their injustice. So the idea is that changes that occur uh, going from wet to dry or hot to cold, for example, um, weather changes, uh, spring into summer, uh, mud into dirt, all of these kinds of changes that we observe in the world uh, are monitored, so to speak, are, are, are somehow a part of the justice of the world. So that if things get too hot for too long, a long, hot summer, Fall will come around, winter will come around, it will change to cold. And uh, likewise, when things are too wet, uh, there's a time it, it will end up that wetness will pay the penalty for its retribution, too much water, and things will eventually dry out. And this is in accordance with the ordering of time. So we have, the, of course, if we're talking about seasons, there's a regular pattern of how things go from hot to cold and cold to hot. And uh, these are regular, these are predictable so that we know when it comes June and July, we're going to be much warmer weather than when it's January and February. And it's order, orderly and predictable. It's made orderly and predictable by the Apiron, by that indefinite substance or originating principle that exists. Now this is of necessity. He says it's according to necessity. The world is a rational system that we can investigate. It, it has to occur in certain ways. And this is very significant for the pre-Socratics. This idea that the world is oh, behaves, so to speak, in a natural way, a predictable way, as we saw with Thales predicting the, the eclipse, uh, this is the spirit of inquiry assuming, right, making the, the judgment that things are understandable and rational and we can investigate them. This is a, a big step from just kind of a, a shoulder shrug and, oh, oh, well, the gods do what the gods are going to do. This is uh, saying that everything behaves rationally and we can investigate it. Aristotle gives a little bit more flavor to uh, what Anaximander was talking about. So I'm quoting a, a longer section here in, in the, from the physics of Aristotle uh, than what we have in the fragments in the textbook. And this is, of course, talking about Anaximander saying that the elements are opposed to each other for example, air is cold, water is moist, fire is hot. And if one of these were infinite, the rest would already have been destroyed. We get a sense of an argument here, right? If, if everything were fire, there'd be no room for things being cold or moist, right? But as it is, they say that the infinite or the unbounded, that's the Greek word, the apiron, right, is different from these. It doesn't have those necessary opposites within it, and that they come into being from it. So the aperion of Anaximander is that archae, the originating substance, out of which the four elements exist. So we saw in Aristotle's quote here a, an idea of an argument. So here's the main argument of Aristotle. And so far as argument exists in his text, this is it. So we have hot and cold, uh, warm and, and cool, the, the dryness and the moistness. These are thought of as substances in a way. 
as much as they are thought of qualities or properties that other objects have. And so the opposites are at war or in conflict with one another. And they're almost right personified here, but th that would be taking it too far. He's not anthropomorph anthropomorphic about this, um, but they are in conflict and all the elements are either opposites or essentially connected to an opposite. And again, we can easily see water being cold and moist, fire being hot and dry. And so we have those opposites. Now, if one of those elements were the arche, that would be a problem then. No one of the opposites or elements essentially connected to an opposite could have been the arche. No, no, it doesn't make sense. Its opposite would never have come to be. So this is Anaximander doing something that is a still a classic tradition in philosophy. He appreciates his, his teacher. He is glad for the insight that he gained from Thales, but he has an argument showing that Thales couldn't possibly be correct because we draw the conclusion now that no element, no familiar stuff can be the original arche. So this rules out water. So Anaximander has this argument that he uses to show that Thales is wrong about the arche. And this is his reasoning, right? So this is, this is new. This is something different to have people in the culture reason carefully about the things that exist, have clear arguments about those things. This is something new that the pre-Socratics provided for us. Okay, so we have the Apiron instead of water being the Arche. And to kind of sum up the idea from the argument, right, the problem for thinking that the ultimate substance is water is that water is a determinate kind of stuff and it's essentially cold and essentially wet. Right? So if that was all that exists, right? If, if originally there was only water, if we think, if we have a cosmological terp interpretation of the water being the arche, the stuff out of which everything else began to exist, we're left with no account of how there could be any hot or dry or the element of fire. So the arche or the original element has to be neutral in quality and it has to be independent of all those elements, the, the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and the pairs of opposites, right? It has to be independent of those as well. It can't be hot or cold or wet or dry. And that's why we're led to the apiron, which is indefinite, unbounded. And one way of thinking of this, and this is an analogy, and like all analogies, there are, are limits to how far we can take it. But the Apiron is like the hand in the rock, paper, scissors game. It continues to exist through other elements and uh, continue to trump one another, right? The other elements, uh, rock uh, trumps scissors and, and paper uh, trumps rock and scissors trumps paper, right? These, these are going back and forth, right? Kind of like Anaximander thought of the elements. Uh, one gains and one loses at one time or another. But existing through it all is the hand, and that would be the apuron, right? It's, it's the one thing that's indefinite and can take the shape or the form of rock or paper or scissors. Or, of course, if you're more sophisticated with the game, um, you also add lizard and Spock to the options. Okay, so the Apiron has uh, the divine traits of being infinite. So this substance is, is a little more than just an element, right? It, it provides justice for the universe and it's infinite. It's unrestricted, right? It's not bounded. That's inherent in the name, the Apiron. It has agency. Right? Its actions are intentional, and again, it assures justice. It brings about justice. This is a divine trait. And finally, it is creative. Right? The Apiron has the trait of being creative. So all of those things put together, and you have a godlike arche. 
right? So this is, while um, Anaximander is providing arguments as to why we should reject the gods as explanations for things like eclipses and thunderstorms and earthquakes, he also, though, is very fond of the idea of a being that has agency, right, that is in control of things. And that's what the Apiron is. Now, Anaximander did other things in his work. Uh, he also proposed an explanation for a variety of things, such as the origin and structure of celestial bodies, um, so that he can explain eclipses by there being these tubes and vents, and they're somehow uh, closed to think uh, like a Pringles can, and the lid being slid over, being twisted over the top, and that way you see uh, the moon having various stages or a sun might have an eclipse occasionally. And that provides a rational explanation for the earth and heavenly bodies. And so you can read the details there, the earth being like a column and, and we have these vents and these celestial spheres. He even talks about sizes, the, being, the sun being a lot larger than the earth, which he was correct about that, although the ratio uh, is a little different than what he suggested. Um, the origin of life, he discusses. He has this explanation for how humanity as a species came about. So this is certainly not evolution of the kind we're familiar with, but it is a kind of explanation of where humans came from that we see in fragments 9 and through 11. And again, the fragment numbers may differ according to your text, but he, he spends some time uh, speaking on those topics. Okay, so let's let's wrap it up. Uh, what's the significance of Anaximander? What what should we say he accomplished? What did he provide for us? Well, one thing that he did is he provided a response to the perceived logical difficulty in Thales' theory. So we had this concern with Thales: if everything's water, how do you get something like fire or heat or right dryness? Um, and he uses arguments to draw conclusions about the world. He's, he's being rational in his inquiry. And that's providing a model then, of course, for the philosophers who follow after him. He postulates a theoretical entity to explain observable phenomena. He's postulating the Apiron. The Apiron isn't something that you can go find and scoop up some of it, right? That's not how he's thinking of it. It's a theoretical entity. It's not something that's observable directly by us. And this is a model for science, right? It's, it's a model for science today still to postulate theoretical entities that explain then observable phenomena. So that's how we began thinking about black holes. We postulated the existence of these things. That would help us explain what we were observing with our telescopes. And that was before we had a way of, of verifying their existence. So, so that's how science progresses, by postulating theoretical entities that can't be observed. But there's also a moral aspect to the Apiron that we spoke of. It renders justice. There's agency in the Apiron. Uh, it brings about change. It's moving in nature. It's causing the things that we observe to change. And so what gave origin to the universe is still active in some sense. It's still there. So it's not merely some originating substance. It's something that's, we might even say, living and active today. So Anaximander uh, made great strides in philosophy. He, he set some models for, for people to follow after him. Very significant an important philosopher of the pre-Socratics.